Hello everyone, welcome again to Arkansas Live. I want you to join me all week long. We've got some great guests today and a great message, a teaching message <clears throat> uh, for Arkansas Live all week long. But we're going to start off today. Uh, our topic is the Ten Commandments and America's Republic. Now I want you to think about that a minute, put it together, because I think you're going to get some information from our guest, uh, Dr. Scott Stewart, pastor of Agape Church, and Senator Jason Rapert, uh, state senator. Uh, there's been a lot in the news uh, about the Ten Commandments monument, its installation, its destruction. But I think it's really important that we understand why the Ten Commandments are on the state capitol ground. And they're being uh, remanufactured, they'll be rebuilt and reinstalled. So join me today, call friends and neighbors, tell them to tune in. And uh, right now we're going to pray for those in authority because this is our mandate. We know Timothy tells us to pray for all those in authority. So wherever you're watching, even if you're watching in another country, you can pray with us. Father, we pray for all those in authority, for kings, for leaders of men. We pray so we can lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. We pray for protection for our president, vice president, senators, representatives, our governor, our mayors, our state senators, our pastors, our law enforcement officers. We pray for all in authority. We bind principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, and wicked spirits. And we plead the blood of Jesus. We apply the blood covenant of, for protection over all those in authority. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I want you to welcome to Arkansas Alive, Senator Jason Rapert. Thank you for Good having me. Good to have me. you here. Pastor Scott Stewart. Hello, Good to sir. have you. Scott is my pastor, and so if you have any complaints, go to him. <laughs> um, yeah. Let's talk just a minute about uh, these Ten Commandments. Jason, yeah, <laughs> this, is, this is, is something that you've been dealing with for yeah. some time, and uh, I'm quite sure it was a shock to you uh, when the Ten Commandments were installed, and then the next day they were destroyed. And um, I want you to help people understand why the Ten Commandments on the state capitol grounds. Yes. And it's not just it's not just a religious thing. It's no. a it's a historical heritage thing. Yeah. Well, and, and thank you again for having us on and covering the story the way that you have. Uh, you know, Act twelve thirty one is the authorizing legislation to allow the Ten Commandments monument to be on the Capitol grounds. It was passed by a supermajority of the Arkansas legislature, was signed by Governor Hutchinson into law in 2015. And so for two years we've been waiting for this process. The American History and Heritage Foundation raised the funds to make the private donation. And uh, the reason that we put it up is there were many monuments on the state capitol grounds, but there was no monument which specifically honored or made reference to the historical moral foundation of law or law itself. And so in looking at that, it just seemed natural. One of the first written codes of law ever in history, obviously, is the Mosaic Code, the Mosaic Law, which is the Ten Commandments. And in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, uh, when they formed their first written codes of law here in the 1600s on American soil, they used the first five books of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch. It's literally written. That was their code. Mm -hmm. And it said when anything else does not actually speak to an issue, then the Word of God will actually be hold true. Yeah. So they referred to not only the Pentateuch, but they said the Word of God in its whole. And so for here in Arkansas, because of the environment of this rabid anti-Christ spirit that has happened, you have people that's always trying to run God out of the public square. So we passed a law which spoke to the uh, historical nature of the monument. As you know, people are going to be watching your program trying to, to get me uh, and, and a, try to trap and say, well, you did it for X. No, the law speaks for itself. Yeah. Now, Jason Rapert, an ordained evangelist, Jason Rapert, a citizen, there are things that the Ten Commandments mean to me that it may not mean to someone else. Right. But the law speaks for itself. And I want to take just a second uh, to tell okay. you on a couple of things here, <clears throat> controlling the legal authority. 
The Supreme Court has upheld as constitutional a Ten Commandments monument on the Texas State Capitol grounds. You've heard me say that before. Yeah. That was Van Orden versus Perry in 2005. In that opinion, the court simply said, simply having religious content or promoting a message consistent with a religious doctrine does not run afoul of the Establishment Clause. That's key. The Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals relied on Van Orden upholding a similar Ten Commandments monument uh, in ACLU Nebraska Foundation versus City of Plattsmouth. The majority opinion in that case said, like the Ten Commandments monument at issue in Van Orden, the Plattsmouth monument makes passive and permissible use of the text of the Ten Commandments to acknowledge the role of religion in our nation's heritage. Similar references to and representations of the Ten Commandments on government property are replete throughout our country. Buildings housing the Library of Congress, the National Archives, the Department of Justice, the Court of Appeals, and the District Court for the District of Columbia and the U.S. House of Representatives all include depictions of the Ten Commandments. Indeed, in the U.S. Supreme Court's own courtroom, a frieze depicts Moses holding tablets that represent the Ten Commandments and the Ten Commandments decorate the metal gates around the doors. And last, the Supreme Court, in a rare unanimous decision, has also clarified that governments that accept privately funded monuments like the Ten Commandments monument in Arkansas are not required to accept all monuments. I want to slay that, key, I want to slay that false dragon mm. that's out there. The Satanic Temple, as much as they posture and much as they holler at the state of Arkansas, they cannot and never was able to force a monument of Baphomet on our Capitol grounds. And here's how they close that statement. We think it's fair to say, this is the court, that throughout our nation's history, the general government practice with respect to donated monuments has been one of selective receptivity. A great many of the monuments that adorn the nation's public parks were financed with private funds donated by private parties. Sites managed by the National Park Service contain thousands of privately donated, designed and funded commemorative objects, including the Statue of Liberty, the Marine Corps War Memorial, the Iwo Jima Monument, and the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. States and cities likewise have received thousands of donated monuments, but while government entities regularly accept privately funded or donated monuments, they have exercised selectivity. That means, uh, Pastor, that you cannot force the state of Arkansas to put up a monument of anything you say you want up. Right. And the state of Arkansas also passed legislation to say you cannot even begin the process until you get a bill passed in the state of Arkansas. So I want the Arkansas people to know out there, all of this talk about forcing a statue of Baphomet or by the Satanic Temple, it's simply false. There is no discussion further. The Supreme Court has ruled on this issue and I see the precedents that are in place and we know the Texas State Monument is up in Denver, Colorado at the capital of Colorado stands a monument just like ours. In, the, in Missouri, I'm told they have a monument as well. We know of over 180 locations mm -hmm. where these monuments have been up. And so I tell people it's time that people in this state, in this country, stand up and say, you know what, the country would be better off if we all would honor the tenets yes. of the Ten Commandments. Yes, amen. Our pastor has taught us that uh, yes. many, many times. It would change our culture. Now, uh, Pastor Scott, your uh, involvement here, and the reason that I, I, I'm so glad you could be with us today, your, your background in Biblical Hebrew, mm -hmm. your study of the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, um, and our church uh, was very instrumental in the, the beginning of helping the uh, monument on the Capitol. Mm -hmm. I, I'd like for you to address the connection, I call it the connection, between America's government mm -hmm. and the Ten Commandments. Right. Okay. Well, if we, if we accept the fact that we are a Judeo-Christian society, I guess you have to start off with the, with the premise that that's the way our founders were. Uh, and as a matter of fact, um, I'm going to be teaching this entire month on um, living free based upon our nation's connection. And on the center of my pulpit right now, I have the original seal of the United States, which is a picture of Pharaoh on one side, Moses on the other. 
the sea being split, a pillar of fire, clouds around it, and the Egyptians drowning in the sea. <laughs> that was our first wow. nation symbol. And we'll talk about that actually on this coming Sunday. How our founding fathers fully connected themselves with the Hebraic nature. They saw us as once again being people, Israelites in a way, seeking freedom and God splitting the sea and making a way for us in a new, in a new homeland. So at the very beginning, and we can't forget our, the founders came here in, in search of religious freedom that they could actually worship God in the way that they wanted to. And they carried with them that, that, that seed of greatness that is contained in the, um, in the Word of God in primarily the Ten Commandments. Our founders understood that. I'm going to read a quote from the fourth president of the United States, one of the founding fathers of the Constitution, James Madison. Okay. He said, we have staked the future of all our political institutions upon the capacity of each and all of us to govern ourselves and to control ourselves, to sustain ourselves according to the Ten Commandments of God. Mm -hmm. So the Constitution itself was written for a certain type of people. Right. If people are in positions of authority to which the, cover, the, the Constitution was not written, then what they have to do is begin to try to change it to make it fit them. That's because the, the Constitution was written for as, as a uh, Christian order. A Christian, a Christian order, that's right. And, uh, and as, um, uh, as the second president of the United States uh, told us, he said, he said this Constitution was written for a, a, a religious and a faithful moral people. And right. if you don't have faith-filled moral people in government, the Constitution is not a fit for them. So they work to change it into their image. And that is part of the co tension we have at the moment in our country. Now, in Romans 13, <clears throat> it, uh, it says, um, for he, and he's referring to the higher powers, those that are authorities in the land, civil government. He is the minister of God to thee for good, but if you do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is a minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore you must needs be subject not only for wrath, but for conscience sake. Mm -hmm. if, if everybody would live right and do right for conscience sake, mm -hmm. this nation, this culture would be totally different. Entirely. And the Ten Commandments are the foundation of that life. I've heard you teach this in church. What God was doing was setting down guidelines for us to live by. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Okay. If we would live right for conscience sake, mm -hmm. I think Ronald Reagan wrote a book um, primarily dealing with abortion the conscience uh, of America. And he said, if we don't quit killing babies, we sear our conscience. That's right. And I, I want you to know that this, now we're not talking about your subconscious. The Bible doesn't teach that we have a subconscious mm -hmm. mind. Our conscience is part of our, our soul. And if we would live according to our conscience, we would be a kindler, gentler, peaceable nation, but everybody has a different conscience. Yeah. And so the Ten Commandments from a biblical perspective mm -hmm. are to give us that standard. Right. Right. Now, placing the Ten Commandments monument on the state capitol grounds mm -hmm. is a way of acknowledging historical record, law, mm -hmm. uh, the rule of law. You can't, you can't have Christianity without the Hebrew foundation. That's right. I mean, you, you, That's true. There's, no, there's no foundation for the church if you don't understand the Old Covenant mm -hmm. and have the, uh, the laws of the Old Covenant. Mm -hmm. And the church was mm -hmm. built upon it. I, and people ask us all the time, used to, why do you have that Israeli flag and that American flag on the platform? Mm -hmm. <laughs> why do you? Yeah, right. <laughs> because, and I told this one guy, I said, because Christianity's roots are in Judaism. Absolutely, sure. And he said, well, I thought the church replaced Israel. I said, no, 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 that's replacement <laughs> theology. Right. Okay, now we have to deal with an issue that's very sensitive to the body of Christ, believers, some of our viewers. 
the church, by and large, is ignorant of all of this. Mm -hmm. They don't even know. Mm -hmm. Some of the things that, that Pastor Stewart has said and Senator Rippert have said, some of y'all are out there thinking, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. But that's why we have to teach it. So we won't be ignorant of these things. The knowledge of the truth makes you free. Now, next question. Why do people make such a fuss over these Ten Commandments? Why are they so opposed to it? Well, uh, number one, it's because 40 or 50 years of secular humanist teaching in American public schools that has removed any acknowledgement of the history of the country. The first Continental Congress in 1774, when they first met, the first thing they did is they went to prayer and had nearly two hours of prayer. They read Psalm 32 and had nearly two hours of prayer before they did anything else. Every president has taken the oath with his hand on what? The Bible, yeah. mm -hmm. our national motto, in God we trust. They are not teaching this history to our children like they were. Therefore, because they don't know this, they are very easily taken advantage of by the ACLU and the atheists and the mm -hmm. secular humanists because they don't know the foundations. Benjamin Morris, I've brought the book on the yeah. program, The Christian Life and Character of American Civil Institutions, the magnum opus at its time, written in 1864. It's that thick. It talks about every aspect of uh, the Bible and Christianity's influence on the beginnings of this country. That's one reason people make a fuss. They simply don't know that. Now, the second thing that's sad <clears throat> is some church people that will stand up and say, well, I'm a Christian, but. Well, we know there's a big problem typically after yeah. the but. Yes. And so, I'm a Christian, but I believe in separation of church and state. I'm here to tell you today it doesn't show up in the U.S. Constitution anywhere, and I've said many times I'll give $1,000 to any viewer that can write in and show me where it says separation of church and state in the U.S. Constitution. It's not there, Happy, but you've got people, even good church people, that will get up and say that. Yeah. It, it, it is wrong, and so why the fuss? It's because of the lack of education. Now, who can fix it? Every man and woman standing in a pulpit across Every this country. Every pastor. That's there you right. Go. It comes back, I think, that is an overflow of the spiritual content. When, when pastors themselves no longer present the truth, yeah. or they say, as, as I have read in, in several books and heard pastors say, the Ten Commandments are not relevant for us, rip them down off your walls. When you start hearing that, <laughs> yes. then the overflow in society is someone running over the, the Ten Commandments yeah. monument. It is, it inherently becomes a spiritual issue. I think the Ten Commandments especially so. We believe, the three of us believe, that this is the inspired Word of God. However, the Ten Commandments stand out distinctly a little bit in the sense that it's the only part yeah. of Scripture yeah. that God wrote with His own hand. Mm -hmm. Everything else God inspired men to write, but there's one section of Scripture that God Himself descended His hand from heaven and wrote with His own finger these Ten Commandments, which although it's equally as inspired as everything else, it's unique it's very powerful. in all the rest of Scripture. Now, President Trump has vowed to repeal the Johnson Amendment, which yes. will give pastors, mm -hmm. ministers, people of faith, f the freedom to say and do, to endorse, to whatever. But as a pastor, mm -hmm. I want you to speak to the pastors. Mm -hmm. As a pastor, and I've, I've listened, every time you address things like this, and I used to do the same thing, but every time you address things like this, the people applaud. Yes. They're, they're, they're wanting their pastors right, to speak are. out. So encourage the pastors yeah. to stand up and speak up. Yeah. I'll just speak to the pastors out there and say this to you, that we have been given not a, not a, a job, but a calling by God. Yes. If you're a hireling, then you probably should turn off the set right now because this is not going to apply to you. <laughs> but if you are a called man of God, then you have a responsibility from heaven to speak the word of the Lord. And that, w listen guys, we're called to serve our people, not to please our people. We're, served to, we're called to please God and to serve people, but not to please people. The moment you make the mistake of thinking you're here to please your people, is the moment you might as well go ahead and hang up your robe because you become irrelevant in the, in the sense of making a difference in the kingdom of God. 
speak the word and stand strong and let God be your defense in what you're doing. Pastor, mm -hmm. I want to say something on that same subject because one of the phrases that came out of the American Re Revolution was rebellion to tyranny is obedience to God. Mm. That's actually on my pulpit as well. Is that right? <laughs> it's right. It goes and, around the, and, the seal. And, and so you think about this. The reason that they're warring against the Ten Commandments and the things of God is because, for one thing, this country, our Constitution and Declaration of Independence is hinged on the premise that God has given us rights that no man gave us and no man can take away from us. You remove that notion from the United States of America and that thread will unravel the fabric of the entire society because then you can only have the rights that Congress says you can have at any given time. And we know there have been times in this country the past eight years before Trump where they did not en embrace anything of the thing. In fact, I will say this, this country is in worse shape than it's been in my entire 45 years of my life in terms of our, uh, the societal nature. Mm -hmm. We have more racial unrest. We have, this country has codified what God's Word says is an abomination. Mm -hmm. We've killed nearly 60 million kids since mm -hmm. 1973. It's time for people to wake up. And Acts chapter 5 is where they base that phrase Rebellion to tyranny is obedience to God because in Acts chapter 5 it says we're, we're, we will obey God rather than Man. man's law when it comes to that. And I feel we're waking up. You yeah, use the term righteous revolution, I but we are. here's the greatest danger. Donald Trump was a second chance for the United States of America, but all the problems are still across the country and you're seeing that come out with this raging against him. What, what would prompt a man to drive halfway across a state and run over a Ten Commandments monument? What would prompt them to threaten people? What would prompt the government in, in Oregon to shut down a business because they didn't want to participate in a gay wedding? We have problems yeah. that only God can fix in America right. and this is why I'm proud and I want to say before this program ends, thank you to Pastor Scott Stewart and the congregation here because they have been very faithful to reach out and support. And just like anyone, just because they're a church doesn't prevent them from exercising their right to support entities or efforts that uh, are representative of them. And we're happy that they were a part of the Ten Commandments monument. I want to go back to what um, you, you quoted a while ago. If you were a Christian, why would you say, I thought we needed to keep separation of church and state? I, I want to say that I don't mean to offend anybody. But if you are an ignorant Christian, mm. you would say that. Mm -hmm. Now, the ignorance doesn't have anything to do with your IQ. It has to do with your lack of knowledge. And that's what we want to correct here, yeah. the lack of knowledge. Which brings me to our next and maybe final point. Um, we have had questions from yeah. people, and you and I have talked about this. The, the Ten Commandments monument has the pyramid and the eye on it, just like the dollar bill. The all-seeing eye is also used by the Freemasons, the Illuminati, etc. Please explain this to people. Now, the other monuments that you talked about that were constitutionally approved have the same all thing. have the same thing on it. So yep. this is not a, a, a demonic symbol. This no. is not any of those it, things. It's actually completely opposite of what the meaning is supposed to be. And actually, the symbol is used in many other parts of the world, in many other legal documents. Mm -hmm. In many other countries, they have used the same symbol. The symbol actually predates, the Masons were not the first to use it. The Masons adopted it into their use. So I, like I told you, the cross is very important to Christians. Right. We honor the cross. We use the cross symbolism. But the KKK also burns crosses. Mm -hmm. I don't stop keeping a cross in my house just because the KKK misuses that cross. Mm -hmm. So what's happening is very understandable people that may object to different groups that use that symbolism, they'll say, oh, look at that. Well, the fact is, that symbol, when you study the history, the eye is meant to be God looking out over everything on top of everything. Do you know that the what people call the pyramid is supposed to actually be a triangle that represents the Holy Trinity of God in the, in the triangle? So again, an artist sometimes paints something or renders something 
and people see something different yeah. than what the artists intend. So my understanding is that, is that it's historically been the all-seeing eye of God, meaning looking out over everything. And in your pocket, everybody in America has that oh, on yeah. dollar bills mm -hmm. in their pockets. Mm -hmm. And so the legal aspect that's important is that the Van Orden versus Perry case approved that Ten Commandments monument design in its past. So because we're in an, an antagonistic situation where people are fighting it, we thought it's pretty smart to use the same design that was already approved and is standing in other places around the country. So it's a great question. I'm glad you've uh, asked it so we could address that. Now, Scott, yes, sir. can you give us some Hebraic background on this? That I? The, the, I, think what, I think what Jason said pretty much sums it up um, pretty well, that God is an omniscient God, that uh, He's always seeing, he's never, he's never sleeping, He's omniscient in everything that He knows. Mm -hmm. So I think that pretty much sums it up. And yeah. that's, what, that's what it represents. Um, uh, last question, uh, why are the Ten Commandments important? to the history of the United States and how is America's government based on those commandments? We've got about 30 seconds. <laughs> As I mentioned earlier, uh, the Massachusetts Bay Colony, that was their first written code of law. Okay. You see uh, the uh, references to the Pentateuch in a lot of those early documents. You heard the quote that he just gave you there. Yeah. And so it was very, very important, again, with a nation who said that we have God-given rights that no man can take away. They really honored that written word of God. In fact, one of the first acts of Congress in 1782 is they bought 20,000 Bibles, mm -hmm. stamped them in the front that it was authorized version encouraged by the United States Congress, and they spread that out across the country. And so in, in the Van Orden versus Perry case, uh, Justice Rehnquist talks about the building and talks about all of the uses of the Ten Commandments, and that's why it's important. Oh, thank you so much. Contact information, American History and Heritage Foundation, P.O. Box 10388, Conway, Arkansas, 72034. Phone is area 501-336-0918. Uh, the website is AmericanHistoryAndHeritage.org. Contact information for Agape Church, 701 Napa Valley Drive, Little Rock, 7221. Phone area 501-225-0612. Website ACLR.org. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for being here, Thank Sandra. You. I know you've had a, a, a long week, Pastor. Pastor good to have you here. And remember, Jesus is Lord of Arkansas and where you're watching too. Send your questions, comments, and testimonies to Happy Caldwell at P.O. Box 26207, Little Rock, Arkansas 72221 or email happycaldwell at vtntv.com.